Hi, my name is Peter Beinart. I'm a fellow at the Foundation for Middle East Peace, and uh, this is another edition of our Occupied Thoughts podcast. I'm very uh, grateful to be joined today by Jonathan Kutab, who is a Palestinian attorney and human rights activist based in Jerusalem and the author of a new book entitled Beyond the Two-State Solution. Jonathan, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. So Jonathan, do you want to just start maybe by summarizing the argument of the book? Well, uh, the book actually started as an intellectual exercise uh, with, uh, with an American Jewish uh, friend. And uh, we were thinking uh, that the two-state solution has collapsed. Where do we go from now? And, and uh, the other question was, is it possible to find a new vision that addresses the basic need of both people. Because everybody thinks Palestinians want a Palestinian state. And uh, the fact is, Palestinians want the sovereignty and the empowerment and the freedom that comes with a state, but not necessarily a state. You can give us a, an entity and call it a state which doesn't provide these things, and we will not be satisfied. Uh, so we decided to do this exercise of finding out what is it that people really, really need? What is it that Zionists want? And can we address that? Can we provide them that in a new entity that provides all their needs except for exclusivity? That provides it for both people, that addresses the needs of both people? And uh, it, it turned out to be quite an interesting exercise because it is possible. I think it is possible. Uh, but, but first, you have to start by saying why the two-state solution was created. And I was one of the proponents. I, I worked for a two-state solution even before it became the official position of uh, the PLO and the international community because I thought it was a reasonable compromise uh, between these two mutually exclusive ideologies. Well, let, One, let's, start, let's, let, let's start there then. Talk a little bit about how the Palestinian national movement moved towards embracing the idea of the two-state solution. What were the factors that, that led to that? Talk a little bit about some of the internal debates and, and, and what was the vision of what that two-state solution would be like that, that you and uh, other Palestinians came to support? Okay, o originally the Palestinian national movement thought of itself and still does actually as an Arab nationalist movement. Palestine uh, Arabi. Palestine is Arab. Who are all these foreigners coming from all over the world trying to displace and replace us? Eventually, uh, sometime in the 60s, uh, and certainly around the 67 war, people realized that, that there's, there's a few million foreigners who live here and who are going to stay here. So how do we live together with them? Some people started talking about a secular democratic state. But right after 67, we were told in no uncertain terms, if you say secular democratic state, it means you don't accept Israel. It means you don't recognize Israel. And by not recognizing Israel, it's the equivalent of wanting to throw everybody into the sea. It's the equivalent of being basically a second Hitler. Don't do that. Don't go there. So the idea of a grand compromise where Palestinians will be satisfied with 22% of the territory that were uh, the West Bank and Gaza, including East Jerusalem, that were occupied in 1967, uh, and, and sort of give up their claim to 78% of historic Palestine. That was a two-state solution, a, a classic land for peace. Uh, Israel would give up the land it captured in 67, in return, the Palestinians and the Arab world would give it peace, recognition, legitimacy, and acceptance. So that was the grand compromise. Now, if you start chipping away at that compromise by building exclusively Jewish uh, after a while, it becomes impossible to continue 
with this uh, compromise and you have to seek another solution. So let before we, we go to the question of, of, of how this became impossible in, in your view, let me just stick with the notion of what the two-state solution was meant to be from the Palestinian side. So um, two questions that come up a lot on the question of the two-state solution, especially from the, the Jewish or the Zionist side is, well, um, what is what is the how does this fit in with Palestinian right of refugee return, um, and how does and and what does it mean in terms of the character of the state inside the Green Line, which is to say, uh, the, if the did you, you know as you know the Zionist view is always well if you're accepting Israel as a Jewish state that that can't mean uh, uh, mass Palestinian refugee return and it it can't mean it means that the Palestinian citizens of Israel, the quote unquote Arab Israelis, have to accept living in a Jewish state. How was it seen from the Palestinian side, the notion of two states? Well, I, I, I will tell you how most people saw it. Yeah. Most people saw it as the Palestinian right of return would be limited to return to the new Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza. Mm -hmm. Yes, there will be some symbolic return under family reunification. Mm -hmm. Uh, people even talked about 100,000 people over 10 years, 10,000 mm -hmm. people a day. Wouldn't a year wouldn't really mess up the demographic uh, problem. Now, how does that help Israeli uh, citizens who are, who, are, who are Palestinian? People didn't think much about that, frankly. They thought, well, they have their own struggle for equality within the state of Israel. It's an ongoing struggle. It's a legitimate struggle. Uh, basically, yes, we care about them, uh, but but the, the two-state solution dealt with the reality as it existed after '67, and and it was a compromise. And for Palestinians, it was very clear that it was a huge compromise. We were giving up a lot, yeah. uh, and and it was supposed to be. Uh, the floor, not the ceiling of our expectations. Right, right, right. And, and then we found that everybody was talking as if it was the ceiling and they were derogating from it. And, yeah. and, and uh, so many people said, this is not what we signed up for. Uh, and, and this is not our ideology. This is not where, what we believe in. This is what we are willing to accept. And yes. if that doesn't happen, we go back to our default position, which is Palestine Arabi, Palestine is Arab. Right. So, so in you, you know, the, the Israel starts building settlements in the West Bank, Jewish settlements starting in the 1970s and, 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 and has been, uh, you know, continued ever since. So there's been a, for a long time, this debate of when there was a tipping point reached where it became therefore impossible to create a viable Palestinian state. And as you know, there are some people who say, we still have not reached that point. What, what was it that convinced you and when that we had reached a point in which the notion of a viable Palestinian state in the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem became impossible? Well, it, it, was, it was like a slippery slope. Mm -hmm. You could see it from day one. Mm -hmm. uh, when the settlements were built around East Jerusalem, the two rings of high-rise settlements, sort of making it clear that East Jerusalem will be annexed into Israel. And when I talk with my liberal friends, they said, no, 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 no. These are just bargaining chips to bring the Palestinians to the table. We can, of course, we can dismantle them. These are temporary measures, they are not permanent. Uh, but, but I say, look, uh, what I see is not temporary measures. I see people living there with swimming pool, with wash lines, with graveyards, with schools. Uh, I see a permanent civilian presence. Uh, it was actually, frankly, easier uh, for me and everybody else uh, to adopt the two-state paradigm because international law was with it. International consensus was with it. Uh, liberal Israelis were with it. Uh, everybody was with it. Uh, the settlements were clearly illegal under international law. Israel itself didn't treat the occupied territories as part of Israel, but at least verbally continued to speak of them as the territories or the administered territories. Uh, the occupied, sometimes they call them the disputed territories. 
so, so Israel didn't say, we want to keep those, at least not openly. So there was a game that was being played, a deception, while Israel was very actively incorporating uh, and annexing and exercising genuine uh, ownership and sovereignty over these areas, it was pretending that it wasn't. It was pretending this is temporary, we have no uh, ambitions, we have no claims. Uh, this war of 67 was forced on us, we have no territorial ambitions. It's just a question of finding the right Palestinian leadership to agree, finding enough support in the international community, getting the right political party to win the elections in Israel. So it was always this pretense that this is a temporary state of affairs. I think for me, the real uh, dawn of the realization that this is not temporary, this is permanent, uh, came when I looked at the road map uh, the map of roads connecting all the settlements to each other and connecting them all to Israel, uh, th th that made it very clear that the intention, perhaps all along, has been to keep the entire territory. So you've offered an alternative vision. Um, sure. Talk a little bit about um, what this um, what this this one state reality will look like, and let's start with a very basic thing, which people often get hung up on. What would be the name of this of 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 this country? I didn't address that issue. <laughs> <laughs> what is the name? What is the flag? What are the symbols? What is the anthem? Mm -hmm. I say we have to get creative with it. Uh, I, I try to look more into the substance. Okay. Is it, what is it that you really want? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I asked a lot of my Zionist friends, what is mm -hmm. it that you want? Mm -hmm. Okay, you're a Zionist, you want the Jewish state. What is a Jewish state? I mean, you don't circumcise a, a state. What is a Jewish state for you? And uh, some of them said, well, we want a state where there's a, a Jewish rhythm of life in terms of mm -hmm. the calendar and the holidays. That's easy to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And then one uh, thoughtful rabbi told me when I asked him, when I pushed him, he said, well, I want a place where any Jew, anywhere, no questions asked, can go and live and be able to defend himself. I said, maybe I can offer you something better. Mm -hmm. How about a state where any Jew, anywhere, no questions asked, can go where he doesn't need to defend himself? because nobody's out to get him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what is a state? Why is a nation state necessary, either for Palestinians or for Zionist Jews? Uh, what is it that state gives you? I was involved in the negotiations. And, and at one point during the negotiations, it struck me that a Palestinian state is not necessarily uh, the goal of Palestinian nationalism that it may be more interesting for my Israeli interlocutors that there be a Palestinian state than it was for me. What I wanted was freedom. I wanted independence. I wanted sovereignty. I wanted empowerment. And, and if you say, I give you a state, but I don't give you any of these things, what do I want a state for? You, you know, we'll give you a passport. There was a lot of discussion whether we call it a passport or a laissez-passer. So in the end, they, 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 they had both uh, titles. You give me a passport, but I can't issue a passport to any of my relatives abroad. I can't use the passport to fly in and out of the state or, uh, without Israeli permission. So what good is that passport? You give me an air, airport. You know that we had an airport at one time in Gaza. Yes. Uh, but the Israeli regulations were to fly out of that airport instead of taking a three hour trip from Gaza to Tel Aviv and flying out of Tel Aviv airport, instead you check in in the Gaza airport, you take a bus to the area's checkpoint, you get checked, inspected, maybe arrested if you're wanted, and then you take the bus back to the Gaza airport and you fly out. It takes you five hours instead of three. What do I want an airport for if that's what it means? If Israel still con uh, controls who flies in and out, 
uh, then so I started looking for substance. And many people, Palestinians today, will tell you the devil is always in the details. Don't say, I gave you a state. I gave you a passport. I gave you. You can call it a state. But there's no substance. There is no sovereignty. And there's no empowerment. And there's no freedom. Right. Right. So, so let's talk a little bit more. I want to go. I want to talk about Palestinian concerns, perhaps about a one state. But I want to go back to what you were saying about about the Jewish concerns or fears that you were. And, and I think it's to your great credit that that you know, given how much Palestinians have suffered, that you still had that level of empathy to want to try to understand how to satisfy these Jewish concerns. I would say from my perspective, I think ultimately what it comes down to, I think for many Jews is the de is desire for power. And it is, it is based on the fear that when Jews did not have power, when Jews were not in control, all kinds of bad things could happen. So who wants to roll the dice again and try and, 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 and take that risk on an uncertain future? Um, um, in which you give, and, and so this note, this desire for, uh, you know, they might say, okay, Jonathan, you're a nice guy, uh, you know, you don't have, you know, but uh, we don't trust, we just don't, we, the, we, after our experience, we can't trust any, we can't trust Palestinians, we can't trust anybody, the Middle East is a dangerous place, um, we're not going to give up the power that allows us to, to always keep ourselves safe. And um, I think, I know in some ways it is very unfair to force Palestinians to try to have to reassure or answer that question, given that it's Palestinians, not Jews, mm -hmm. primarily who have done most of the suffering. And yet to your credit, you, you are trying to engage in that conversation. So, so how do you respond to that, to that, to that fear? Well, I think, I think the understanding of power uh, it needs to be broken down. Are you talking about power, exclusive power, including power of domination and oppression of others, or shared power? Do you want enough power to ensure that you don't have a second Holocaust and that you will not be per persecuted? If it's the latter, I can provide it for you. I can give you power. I can even, uh, if you read my uh, suggestion, uh, I, I even have uh, two very specific uh, elements that address uh, Israeli security. One of them, quite controversial, and some of my Palestinian friends didn't like it, is, okay, we can have the defense minister, the head of the Air Force, uh, Navy, uh, nuclear commission, permanently, constitutionally, always be Jewish with, a, with an Arab deputy, but every other position in the army will be only based on merit. Uh, the head of the police, however, will always be a Palestinian Arab with a Jewish deputy. So that the day-to-day -day harassment and persecution and discrimination within the country uh, can also be uh, addressed. Uh, so I said, here, if, if this is what, if you think power means being the Minister of Defense, fine, take the Ministry of Defense. I don't need it. Uh, the other uh, suggestion I made is that there would be a Ministry of Cooperation and uh, Coexistence, and that 10% of the defense budget should always go to that ministry. And the job of that ministry was to work for uh, joint projects for informing each community about the history and culture of the other community, because the real danger to an Israeli Zionist Jew today in Israel doesn't come from Iran or Pakistan or Iraq, or it comes from, as I said, a 12 year old Palestinian schoolgirl with a pair of scissors in her <laughs> pocket who wants to stab somebody. So how do you address that? Well, we have a ministry. Part of the defense budget goes towards addressing uh, those uh, basic roots of animosity and intolerance and xenophobia uh, and racism uh, that, that, that are really the, the basic for the lack of security of Israeli Jews today. So I want to ask a, a now come at it from a very different angle. So you know, you know, I also thought about some of these things, and and one of the 
one of the things that I, I, I heard and have read from Palestinian, some Palestinian intellectuals and activists is that um, what really needs to happen for there to be true equality in one state is decolonization, which is to say, it's not enough just to have on the surface even that, uh, you know, maybe even the right to vote. That, that, you know, there are many people who are now kind of somewhat disillusioned by post-apartheid South Africa because there wasn't this redistribution of wealth. Um, you know, that there are huge land issues, land claims, you know, of all of this land that, that, that were taken from Palestinians on both sides of the Green Line. So I wonder if you can talk about this uh, idea of decolonization and, and, and whether you've, what it would take for in this one state there to be a true equality, not just maybe a kind of equality on paper, but in reality, a kind of massive, you know, a kind of massive gap between a, a wealth, a, you know, a more wealthy Jewish population and a, a poor kind of marginalized Palestinian population. Well, I, I also try to address that. Mm -hmm. There will be another ministry, just like you have a ministry of absorption for uh, Israeli Jews who are, for Jews who come, and immigrate into the country, why not have a ministry that addresses uh, uh, the refugees who will come back, as well as those who are already within the country who have lost land or houses. Uh, the, the, the difference is that I speak about uh, not forcing people off of their land. You can give them alternative land, or you can give them compensation. Uh, and I also recognize that we will never have perfect justice. We should have relative justice. We should just address the grievances. I, I'm very impressed uh, when I was in Canada, uh, almost every place I went before I would speak, somebody would stand and say, I want to recognize that we are actually uh, standing on property that really belongs to Indians of such and such a tribe. And, 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 I'm, and I went into shivers for most Palestinians just to recognize that this really is our land that you are occupying and that you have built into this great country. For you to recognize that this is our land is like 90% of the answer. Of course, the other 10% is you have to act upon it by giving us some recognition, some compensation, some alternative ways, and uh, genuine equality, uh, but, but, but just the recognition of the injustice that was done to us, uh, I think will go a long way to remove the bitterness, the, the, the hatred, the, the feeling of injustice that, that eats away on your inside and that causes you to do things that may be totally counterproductive, uh, just to express your sense of outrage at the injustice that was done to you. So, I mean, you mentioned Canada. I'm interested in asking you to talk a little bit more about models. You know, one of the things that people sometimes say is that um, there is no over, at least not now, there is no overarching Israeli-Palestinian identity. It, it, these are two separate nations in a sense. And so um, that this would be at least for the time at the beginning, a, a binational state, a state where you have two separate nations in that way, perhaps different than post-apartheid South Africa, where people, blacks and whites did see themselves as South African. Um, do you believe that there could emerge one joint Jewish-Palestinian national identity? Or how do you think about how you can build a state that is, where you have two nations inside one country? I think it can emerge. Uh, I don't think it can emerge under the present conditions where one party has all power and the other party has no power. No, it cannot emerge. There has to be a genuine bridging of that uh, power imbalance. But once you do that, I think it is possible. Oh, why not? Why not? Uh, people, can, people can have more than one loyalty uh, in the United States today. Uh, you feel fully American without in any way thinking you are not Jewish. Uh, I feel fully Palestinian and fully American at the same time. Uh, that can happen as long as we don't partake of that toxic exclusivity. My people, white supremacy, uh, racial superiority, 
dare I say, chosen people. <laughs> if you think you're special, if you think you're better than everybody else, or more privileged or more entitled, then of course not. We can never have that. Mm -hmm. But if you are willing to think in more universal terms, if you are willing to be open at least to the other being equal, uh, that is why I say it's an ongoing process. That's why I mentioned uh, Arabs have to learn in school Hebrew as a third language. And Israeli Jews have to learn Arabic in school as a third language. Uh, so you, you need to work at it. It's not something that comes automatically. The, the point is, what is your starting point? Is your starting point that this is me, myself, and mine? Do I want to, Israel to be as Jewish as France is French? Do I want Palestine Arabi? Or am I willing to adjust my ideology? to tweak it, to morph it into an identity that is also open to another identity or to another group that is living here with me and which is going nowhere. I wanna, so one of the things that people sometimes respond is they cite public opinion polling and they say, look, um, there's some support among Israeli Jews for a two-state solution. Um, almost no support for one equal state. And even and among Palestinians, even it appears, if you look at polling from the West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem, that Palestinians may still seem to support a two-state solution over the other options, maybe not by as much as they used to, but still. So this is the only uh, answer that still retains substantial support in both communities, so why would one abandon it? So I wonder if you can talk a little bit, particularly on the Palestinian public opinion side, what do you think the pub Palestinian public opinion really is on this question? Right now, there's no question that, that the two-state solution continues to be the dominant paradigm and the dominant language uh, of discussion and the dominant, the uh, supposedly public official view, and many people would go along with it. Uh, the question is, what are you offering them instead? Are you really offering them a, a genuine choice? Is it something that can, in fact, be realized? I think, I suspect it will be easier for Palestinians to move towards a one-state solution than it would be for Israeli Jews, if for no other reason than that we are the weaker party and, and that this would give us some genuine empowerment, which we do not have. What I think we need to get rid of is this concept that I'll give you something, and you can call it a state. Actually, the Trump administration, the Trump plan specifically says uh, a state has no objective uh, criteria. It's whatever people agree it is. Right. So Jerusalem is not an objective place. You can take some neighborhood outside the wall and call it Jerusalem. See, we gave you Jerusalem. Yeah, right. This kind of uh, false. Uh, view of statehood and says, here, you want a state? We gave you a state. What are you talking about? Well, well, no, the question is, what did you give me? Right. What did I get? And, and uh, I think if you give people a genuine sense of empowerment, a genuine sense of self-determination, participation, ownership, you are a stakeholder in this new state, I think you'll find that Palestinians would readily accept it. So I want to talk about the and Palestinian political leadership and how it approaches this issue and whether you see the possibility of change. I mean, it seems to me that you, if you think about, you have the Palestinian leadership in the West Bank, you have Fatah and Mahmoud Abbas uh, support the idea of two states. You have the Palestinian leadership inside of Israel, uh, Ayman Ode also supports two states. And then you have Hamas, which maybe. Uh, unofficially supports two states or maybe talks about an Islamic state, but, but none of the three of them right now, as far as I can see, are talking about the same vision that you are talking about. So why do you think that all three of them are where they are now? And what, how, what do you think it would take to move those Palestinian, different Palestinian leaderships to the place that you are advocating? Well, uh, for one thing, the Palestinian leadership, let's talk about in the West Bank. Uh, is now clearly invested in the two-state solution. Uh, 
Uh, the Oslo and the Oslo agreement is the basis for their power. Uh, they cannot, they literally cannot travel from Ramallah to Nablus, never mind Jerusalem, without Israeli permission. Mm -hmm. It's written into the Oslo agreement. Uh, so, and they need their VIP passes and they need the imports and they need the, the funds. Israel collects uh, uh, taxes and customs on their behalf and holds it against them. So they need Israel to give them the money to pay the salaries. Uh, so the, 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 per, the present Palestinian leadership, uh, I think, has, has really lost its legitimacy as a representative of its people or of Palestinian nationalism. Uh, Hamas is in a similar position in, 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 in Gaza, which is why, by the way, both parties are not eager for new elections. And, and the new elections are more likely to try and preserve their power uh, rather than really allow a genuine new leadership. Uh, the, the point that I want to make, though, is that in order to move forward, we need to abandon the false mirage of a two-state solution. It is not going to happen. I had a Canadian uh, friend uh, who worked in Jerusalem for a while with Mennonite Central Committee. And as, as, as early as five years ago, he told me that uh, he would tell his Israeli friends or, or their supporters, congratulations, guys, you won. There's not going to be a Palestinian state. Now what? And he said that would stun them into silence. Mm -hmm. They have no answer. Mm -hmm. The Palestinian state, or at least the mirage of a Palestinian state, has become part of the oppressive status quo reality, which we need to shatter, which we need to abandon if we can move forward. See, you, you, you can't cure a disease if you're denying it. If you think that coronavirus is just, is just like the common cold, then, then you just suffer. You have to abandon the concept that this is just a common cold. Uh, in order to treat the coronavirus as a serious pandemic. What about, do you believe that um, disbanding the Palestinian Authority would, would, would move in us in the direction of forcing people to accept the one, one state reality? Because in some ways, as you say, the Palestinian Authority is one of the things that props up the notion that there is this Palestinian state in waiting. Now, now, that's an interesting thing, because most Palestinians would want to disband the PA, if you're mm -hmm. talking about polls. Uh, I, I personally don't think that the Palestinian Authority is going to be disbanded, because it's an essential part of the paradigm of control and suppression that Israel uses. If uh, Mahmoud Abbas would resign tomorrow, Israel will find many individuals who would be willing, claiming for patriotic reasons, mm -hmm. to take his place. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not enough to just resign. You have to understand the matrix of control uh, that has been established. Uh, I wrote an article about that when uh, Mahmoud Abbas announced the, the end of Oslo and the abandonment of all uh, cooperation and uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, all coordination with, with Israel. I, I laughed and most Palestinians laughed. What are you talking about? You cannot abandon that. It's not in. It, it's not within your power, never mind your interest, to do that. You still use Israeli currency. You still need to travel back and forth. Uh, right now, you need a vaccine, and then Israel will not give you a vaccine. Now, you don't have any control over your uh, borders, over your uh, property. Uh, the, the only thing you can do is sort of like exercise an additional level of uh, suppression of your own people uh, in the interest of the occupation. Uh, so uh, the Palestinian Authority, unfortunately, has become part of the matrix of control on behalf of Israel for continued occupation. That's a very painful thing to say, and most Palestinians would be reluctant to say it as openly and as frankly as I'm saying it now. But they all feel it. An another, you, you're based in Jerusalem. One um, 
thing that I've heard discussed occasionally is the notion that if you want to move towards one one state and and one uh, equal politics, that that uh, Palestinians in East Jerusalem who are mostly not citizens, but do have the right to vote in local municipal elections in, in Jerusalem, but mostly boycott those elections, could start to vote in those elections and therefore make Jerusalem a kind of an experiment in what a one, a one in what, what this kind of politics might look like. I, I know that there's been a lot of resistance to that, but do you think that would be a move in the direction of the, of the vision that you're, that you're looking for? I do, I do. Actually, Jerusalem provides one of the uh, experiments that can, in fact, uh, lead in that direction very easily. Uh, the problem is that uh, Israel has been very careful not to allow that to happen, and the Palestinians have not worked very hard to make it happen. Uh, people in, in East Jerusalem today, 300,000 of them, are basically political orphans. They used to have uh, the Orient House and Faisal Husseini, the late Faisal Husseini, provide some form of cohesion. That is gone. Those were and the PLO now, representatives in East Jerusalem. Yes. And now the Palestinian, the, the Israeli authorities would treat any, any interference, even to claim that a particular event is done under the auspices of the Palestinian uh, Ministry of Cal Culture is enough to close down that music or that theater or that. So, so Israel doesn't allow the Palestinian Authority to play any role. And, and the Palestinians, they're not Israeli citizens and they don't want to accept the annexation. And they've been sort of told that if you do, you are authorizing, legitimizing uh, the annexation of Jerusalem, uh, which of course they don't want to do. Uh, but, but if you allow Jerusalem to be a real uh, experiment in uh, coexistence, then you have to do a lot more than you're doing now. The, the Jerusalem municipality now totally and blatantly disregards the interests of East Jerusalemites. It collects taxes, are known as taxes from them, but doesn't provide them with services. It doesn't take their interest in town planning and therefore, they always face the problem of uh, unlicensed construction and house demolitions on, on a continuing basis all the time. Uh, they are not uh, given uh, access to their constituents, their markets, either in the West Bank, in the surrounding villages, or with Israel, because they are separated from it. And then you have the wall uh, that was built around them, they are in a very bad situation, although you are right. Jerusalem could act as, as a model. Haifa could act as a model. And, and, and in some ways it does uh, provide some measure of coexistence uh, for Jews and Arabs. So my, my last question is, um, you know, you've described this situation in which uh, the their stuck this the status quo is kind of um, is stuck that Israel has overwhelming power the Palestinian Authority is serving as Israel's subcontractor essentially making Israel's life easier um, uh, obviously the United States is there's not much prospect of American policy changing so that America would really, pressure Israel in a meaningful way. What do you see as the mechanisms uh, that might emerge in the coming years, particularly on the Palestinian side, that might be able to shake this reality to force people to start to have the debate that you want to create? Well, uh, it's, it's obviously a tall order. Uh, when I uh, first wrote this booklet, I deliberately uh, said, and I wanted it to be just uh, the vision and that how you get there is an entirely different, is another book. But, mm. but quickly I realized that you can't just throw an idea like that without giving some suggestions. And I do. Uh, towards the end of the book, you know, I have a brief three or four pages of how do we get there? How do you move in that direction? And, and there are many things that can be done uh, to move in that direction. Most of them would fall under the title of co-resistance rather than coexistence, uh, uh, joint projects that both parties can agree to, 
to ameliorate the suffering and to ameliorate the daily oppression and to start empowering people. And I suggest very specific things, especially for activists in this country and in Israel. Start talking to Hamas, bring them into the conversation. Work for lifting the siege of Gaza, which is a huge, unjustifiable crime daily being committed against the Palestinian people. Lift the siege from Gaza. Start talking about lifting the state of emergency and, and stop using administrative detention, uh, nighttime raids, uh, military courts for children. Uh, stop that, uh, because that's not helpful. That doesn't promote anything other than oppression and suppression and supremacy. Uh, start working jointly, non-violently, to resist the occupation in the West Bank, in Area C. Allow people to start building and developing in Area C of the West Bank, which is like 60% of the West Bank, which is today effectively annexed into Israel, and, and give in to exclusive Jewish settlements. Uh, stop this, the, the, this apartheid system of separate uh, laws and rules and regulations and privileges for one community at the expense of another. There's no other way of saying it. The current situation is evil, oppressive, uh, and, and needs to be changed. It's a struggle and it's an ongoing struggle and, and I am trying to say, can we join in that struggle together rather than against each other? Do you have something to benefit from moving from the current structures to a more just and a more lasting uh, new reality? Uh, well, Jonathan, it's, it's an inspiring vision. Um, uh, uh, and I hope that... Um, uh, I hope through your efforts um, that we can move closer towards it. And um, uh, the book uh, is called Beyond the Two-State Solution. I would really recommend that people look at it. And um, thank you so much for spending some time with me. Thank you, Peter.